and I'm your warm-up act so that we get a few of those people out there to come and sit down in the chairs. Um, basically, OC, we do these stages because the people that are going to be talking are people in one way or another have been involved in the OC program and will be involved in the future, and they involve the, the face of innovation, the new things that are happening, and this is what we're really about. We're about industry, its innovations, and using the agricultural system, uh, the academic system to be the, uh, the, the partners in the process. And I don't want to take up too much of your time. They only give me two minutes, but uh, I'm going to introduce Charles Gagnon uh, from Canadore College, and he will be our moderator, and Charles will introduce you to the panel. Uh, we'll, we'll, each panel member will have a presentation, and there'll be some questions at the end. Charles? Thank you, Richard. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, basically, what I do is I develop partnerships between business and industry and the college. Uh, Canador has been involved in aviation for over 40 years. It's interesting because we had a group of about 60 business people come up last Friday to listen to federal funding and various programs. And out of the 60 people, 59 had never seen the aviation campus. And so it's, I always say it's one of North Bay's best held secrets. Uh, I've been involved also in the creation of an um, innovation center for advanced manufacturing and production. And basically what we've done is we've created a center operational in September that's going to take you from 3D laser scanning to 3D virtual reality simulation to 3D prototyping, printing, alongside with robotics, CNC machines, water jets. And I was listening to Peter yesterday and I'm saying, man, are we on the right track in what we're doing? Because we're doing this for industry to help enhance not only the service industries of the aerospace industry, but also the aerospace industry itself. Uh, we strongly believe in entrepreneurial learning and we're, we've basically, we're scaling up all of, of our programs, not only to meet the needs of tomorrow, but developing new programs for the needs of, to, of today. And just the, the last message, because this is not about me, it's about these people that are sitting here, is I strongly believe that the aerospace industry has a tremendous amount of opportunity with colleges throughout Ontario. There are numerous colleges in southern Ontario, but also in northern Ontario, that can, con can contribute tremendously to the advancement of the aerospace industry in Ontario. So now I'd like to br briefly introduce you to our panelists, and I'm going to introduce every one of them, and then afterwards I'll call upon them to come up and make their presentation. So our first panelist is Rod Jones, Executive Director of the Ontario Aerospace Council. Uh, in the aerospace industry, uh, Rod has um, a broad knowledge and strategic insight developed through general management of aerospace of small and medium enterprises and active leadership in industry associations, related associations, and the national and provincial levels. So thank you for being here, Rod. Our next panelist is Brian Eggleston, consultant with Venture Flight. Brian's long time uh, or lifelong interest is in creating new aircraft designs and undertaking research on aircraft aerodynamics and propulsion systems integration. Uh, Brian became Director of Strategic Technology at Bombardier Aerospace Group in 1996, and in the last 10 years, Brian has continued to work as a consultant on new aircraft and on research and design of unmanned aircraft concepts leading to the development of the TD-100 aircraft as well as the research with Brighton Automated Systems. And I believe, Brian, the TD-100 is the one that we see over there, an interesting aircraft. Welcome, Brian. Our third panelist is Jay Goodsall. He's founder and CEO of SolarShip. At McGill University in 1989, Jay wrote an economic thesis proposing the use of airships for transport in landlocked countries in Africa. Uh, 15 years later, Jay created SolarShips Inc. to develop a solar-powered hybrid aircraft for delivering medical cargo to remote areas. SolarShip was recently awarded a grant from the federal government's Sustainable Development Technology Canada program to develop an aircraft for delivering cargo to areas such as Northern Ontario. So welcome, Jay. Our fourth panelist is Marty McVicker, President of Operations at Airron Labs. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> My French gets in my way sometimes. Marnie joined the Aeron uh, team in 2008, one year after it became a reality. 
Like the rest of the team, she worked on many of the demands of the early days. She is uh, proud to be part of a can-do team that is changing the way the world thinks about micro unmanned aerial vehicles and they all bring to the way the world works. Welcome, Marnie. Our final panelist is Murray Gamble, Director of Simulation Engineering at the Center for Visualization and Simulation at Carleton University. A certified modeling and simulation professional, Mr. Gamble is, rec is a recognized expert in the areas of high-level architecture and visual simulation and is often called upon as a subject matter expert from industry and from government. Thank you, Murray, for joining us today. Pleasure. From the forest to aerospace, an in interesting career, I have to tell you. Uh, I, you know, when I was thinking about it and I agreed to come here, we had a saying in my industry, you can't see the forest from the trees. And sometimes what happens with industry, they want to grow, but they've never gotten out of their sphere. And one thing I've learned, I've certainly learned, is when you get out of your industry and you look elsewhere, it's amazing what you can learn. Uh, we are now involved in the uh, flight simulation with UAVs. UAVs is the future, and, uh, and I looked at the, some of the material that you were provided. We're talking about the use of aerospace equipment in land use and so on, the tremendous potential there is in this country in the use of UAVs. And we hope that our governments are going to wake up and realize that they need, they need to change the way they're doing things and allow us to progress in that area. So that's enough as far as I'm going to talk. I'm now going to call on our first speaker, Mr. Rod Jones. Please come up. Thanks, Charles. Wait till the technology gets going here a little bit. And I'm just going to stand here and do this if that's okay. And my, my job is to give you the 30,000 foot level on what's going on in the, uh, in the aerospace industry and uh, innovations therein. And uh, so let me just walk you quickly through what's happening. I'm going to focus mostly on the commercial aerospace industry. That's the part that makes the large commercial jet transports from uh, Airbus to Boeing to Bombardier to uh, Embraer and so on. Because that's where the dominant part of the Canadian industry and indeed the Ontario industry is situated. So. Um, just quickly on the OAC, that's the industry organization for uh, the aerospace industry in Ontario. Uh, it's been around for a while. It's really about uh, being the voice of the industry in Ontario and uh, certainly working with our companies to help them improve their business performance, access to markets, technology development, uh, supply chain improvements, and so on. Um, that's the board of directors, sorry for the eye test, but uh, all of the companies in the industry are really around the table. Uh, coming together to decide what's in the best interests of the industry and then working together to make it happen. Um, so th there are about four things that I would describe as, the, as dominant trends in the, in the industry. Uh, the first of all, it's, it's a growth industry. Second, it's globalizing. Third, there's big changes going on in the supply chain. And critically, this is an industry where innovation matters hugely and that comes out of the R&TD efforts that we make. So I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. Uh, air travel has historically grown uh, about uh, 5% on average compound annual growth rate. So that means it doubles about every 15 years. That's been the case for many years and it's expected to continue. What that means is that we'll double the number of aircraft in service from about 17 or 18,000 today to about 35,000 in the next 20 years. That's a tremendous rate of production of aircraft, unprecedented in the history of the industry. So big growth challenges. It's a globalizing industry, and uh, the blue dots are the ones that are historical locations for aerospace activity. The red ones are where there are emerging and new uh, clusters of capability. Um, and the other change that's going on is really big changes around the supply chain. The whole push down of responsibility, risk, investment, uh, everybody in the supply chain has to step up and do more. And that's uh, so folks making parts have to do kits, have to take a design responsibility, step up and do much more in that sense. Uh, and that's the expectation up and down the supply chain. In the area of technology um, and innovation, there are four key drivers. Environmental performance throughout the whole of the regime, uh, aircraft, manufacturing, the navigation system and so on. Economic performance clearly throughout the life cycle, safety and reliability, and certainly passenger experience. 
Um, and we've not done as much as we should have done over the last number of years. And as Charles said, there's tremendous assets in the research organizations in, in Ontario that we can capitalize on, and in Canada that we can capitalize and need to do more of. Um, we also need to make sure that we're responding to the market demands that are out there and that our, we're balancing between the technology push and the market pull side of, uh, of uh, d driving technology, if I can put it that way. I just wanted to tell you a couple of uh, small stories and I'm gonna leave you with three kind of messages. Um, the story is about a program that NASA uh, ran uh, several years ago. And the goal of that program was uh, within 20 years to reach, or 25 years, to improve fuel burn on aircraft, commercial aircraft, by 70%, to improve, to reduce um, um, uh, nitrous oxide emissions by uh, 75%, and reduce the noise levels of those aircraft by uh, 71 dB, which is huge. And they set four industry teams to work on that, all the major names, the Boeings and Lockheed Martins and Northrop Grumman's and Honeywell's and so on. And they all came together as four separate teams to meet that challenge. And they came up with a whole raft of aircraft solutions, all aerodynamically viable, but some a little stranger than we might have uh, normally seen. Lots of different configurations. Uh, the, kind that we may well see in, uh, in our lifetimes, the uh, blended wing body type of aircraft. A uh, few other configurations that you see here, uh, ducted fan propulsion, uh, all kinds of interesting concepts for ways to achieve those goals. Um, the interesting thing is that none met all of those NASA challenges. So that was uh, not inconsistent with what we know in aerospace. And we say the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer, which may account for some of the reasons why aircraft development programs take such a long time as they do. So the second thought I want to leave you with, well, just finally, just some areas. This is by no means a definitive list. And I think having listened to Peter yesterday, I would have some additional uh, additions to this. But those are some of the areas in which we've got technology kind of uh, opportunities to really drive things differently in aerospace. Second last thought I'll leave you with is um, Donald Rumsfeld said, uh, we're all good with knowing what we know and we know what we don't know. The real challenge is that we don't know what we don't know. And it's in that whole area of unknowns that I think our best opportunities lie. And if you think to what uh, Peter uh, Diamanda said yesterday about this whole opportunity for technology, exponential technology and exponential community, that, I think, gives us the capacity to drive into those unknown unknowns and really make the world the fabulous kind of a place, that abundant kind of place that he thought it would be. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Charles, and he will present some of my colleagues who have already started on that journey and will tell you some of the fabulous things that they're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rod. I think I'll stay sitting. I'd like to now call on uh, Brian Eggleston to please come up and make his presentation. I'm here to talk about an airplane that only flies below 1,000 feet at this point, so uh, it's well below Rod's 30,000, but take it from me, it's very interesting. Okay, this is a picture of the airplane that we're involved in. It's called TD-100. It's about 15 foot span, weighs about 55 pounds. On the left, you can see it has what we call a very high aspect ratio wing, it's like a glider. On the right uh, is a picture taken at Goose Bay at the military test range there. The guy in the white shirt is Brian McClucky, the president of BRICAM, and he's busy telling some interested military people what the airplane can do. At that time, the airplane was taking off from wheels, and you can see some large tires below it. In the picture to the right, we've now developed a pneumatic launcher, which can get the airplane up to flight speed in about 10 feet. So at the end of the rail there, it's uh, going about 50 miles an hour. And we've been taking off a lot more safely since we adopted that method. TD-100, it's created by a small company called Brycan, located in Brampton. Been in business about 30 years, 
Uh, its focus has been the application of robotics to manufacturing. Uh, Brian McClucky and myself have a background going back to the 1980s of collaborating in aviation. And <clears throat> in 2009, we saw a need for the application of UAVs to civil uh, applications, civil roles. At that time, practically all of the UAVs were in military service. Anyway, we created a, an initial concept about three and a half years ago, and the airplane we're flying today is pretty much like the original drawings. The airplane was created as a demonstrator. We're airplane people. We're not into uh, sensors particularly. We're not into avionics. We're not into water pilots. So this was our, if you like, our platform for learning how to be a UAV. At this point, we're the only Canadian manufacturer of UAVs, fixed wing UAVs, because we have somebody else here uh, in Canada. So we're very hopeful that uh, we'll find a home. Development has been mainly funded by SR&D tax credits, personal loans uh, in the first couple of years, and now we have some venture capital. The key to the airplane relative to its competition is the fact it has a very large payload capability. The fuselage, the proportion of the fuselage that you can put things in is probably twice the volume of any of our competitors. The airplane is very clean. It flies on less than 400 watts, if you're used to thinking of those terms, which is very low. Uh, it's also made from composites. It's a hollow shell, carbon on the outside, layer of foam, and then glass cloth on the inside. When it was first made and flown as a radio control airplane, it weighed only 35 pounds, and that included 12 pounds of batteries and five pounds of electric motor. So it is incredibly light. It's also incredibly strong because we designed it to meet civil certification airloads. The airplane has what we call a G capability of over 10 G. Uh, no ordinary airplane has that capability. We could fly this thing into storms if we needed to. Uh, electric power gives us just over two hours of endurance. Uh, we will need more than that. We're looking at a multi-fuel engine, an internal combustion engine, which will take us beyond the 20 hour mark. And at that point, you really get interested. You really get interest from pipelines, power line kind of people. There are some other things listed here, which I won't go into because I've only got a short time. But the big thing is we haven't done anything which individually is a first, but we brought it together in a package which is really creative. And it's been called disruptive technology by some of the people that we're working with. We can do things which no other airplane of this size can do in terms of payloads that we can carry. Here's a picture of the aeroplane, and around it uh, are various pictures of, in, of instruments that can be carried. Uh, the bottom two to the left shows the uh, Fleur A65 camera, a thermal camera. It also shows a Nikon D300, which is one of their top line professional cameras. Both of those fit inside of the payload bay. To the left of that is a unit made by Aplanix. Now this is likely our jewel in the crown. It produces images which are at a level where you can see centimeter accuracy. It can geo-reference every pixel that's in the picture. And they also can be combined in, in other ways. You can get 3D imagery from the pictures. Other things on there that are of interest, top left is by Avantech. It's a weather probe which can measure the three components of velocity while the airplane's flying, and it can measure them to a 0.1 meter per second accuracy. The ones on the right are other payloads that as yet we've got to address, but they would fit inside of the vehicle. This is a cut through the center line of the airplane to just show you how complicated it is inside. And in the middle, under the, oh, this thing doesn't work at that range. No, okay, let's try this side. It's me that doesn't work at this side. Between the, below the wing, you can see two cameras. There's a Nikon camera and the FLIR camera, and it's storage. So you can see that they don't fill the payload bay, but there's ample volume around it for carrying. Other things to notice about it, up on the top of the fin is a fin top camera, a very small camera. The airplane can be flown by it. The vehicle is equipped with satellite. It can be uh, the waypoints that go to the autopilot can be reprogrammed in flight so we can adjust its flight via satellite at long distance. 
big thing about the aeroplane is that it can do the same things that currently are done by fixed wing helicopters or small aeroplanes in the Cessna range. We reduce the amount of fuel that you burn, uh, we reduce noise, we reduce costs, you don't put people in the air, observers don't get tired, uh, they're not exposed to the potential for crashing. It turns out that mortality amongst wildlife uh, scientists uh, due to air crashes is quite high, so they're very relieved that this kind of uh, technology is coming along. In the near term, we're flying missions uh, in forestry applications. We're up at Burwash using the thermal <coughs> camera to locate fires. Uh, we're also going whale hunting, uh, counting polar bears, counting caribou, uh, using the Nikon uh, capability. And we'll be doing aerial mapping. Again, uh, th this is taking place in Goose Bay. We're also going to be doing surveying on behalf of hover barges that will be used north of Timmins for carrying large payloads uh, into the wilderness in sp through winter and, and normal conditions. One of the other things we'll be doing is we'll be flying at Goose Bay over the military test range uh, looking for unexploded ordnance which is on the surface and has to be cleared. We'll be using the Nikon camera for that. There's a whole list of other applications, which I haven't got time to get into. Uh, one of the top of the list in terms of uh, money generation is likely offshore oil and assisting exploration. Uh, the other ones are pipeline applications and hydro tower monitoring. Safety is of paramount importance when you're flying a UAV. If we want to fly mixed up with general traffic, we have to have means of controlling the aeroplane. At this point, you can only fly within about one and a half kilometers from your site. So the pilot is, is, is flying locally. In the long run though, and long run here is maybe two or so years, we want to be able to fly beyond line of sight. And to do that, uh, we'll be putting on a transponder on the airplane that tells other airplanes we're there, also detects other airplanes. And at our control station, we'll be able to see all the traffic. To make it even safer, we've purchased uh, a radar which is normally used on a, on a boat, it's been modified, and we can see out to 20 miles with the, with the radar and make sure that the area is clear and sterile of other, other airplanes. If we do see something, the, the autopilot can be reprogrammed using the satellite link to avoid the threat. Some of the pictures that we've taken, top left is the wilderness at Goose Bay, the inset, which you can't see when you look at the big picture is actually caribou. There's two, two adult caribous and three small ones. In the middle is a beaver dam that we've taken pictures of. To the left is a duck pond. And if you blow that out, each pixel there is about one centimeter long to give you an idea of the accuracy that we can get. Um, to the right are some FLIR camera images. Uh, normal temperatures on the right, so cold water shows up as deep blue. Uh, there is a tractor in that picture, and you can actually identify the tires on the tractor. The difference between the front and back tires. Below that, if you put hot spots in there, the colors all scale. The two small dots that you see uh, are actually barbecues with the lids closed. The bottom one is a mosaic of pictures that have been stitched together uh, to show the a panorama of the runways at Goose Bay. This area is moving at a tremendous pace. Uh, we're in it now and we're going to have to stay ahead and we can see that it's going to, it's going to require continuing R&D. The two areas of most importance are propulsion and we'll be looking at fuel cell applications, for instance, and the, the application of robotics to manufacturing is another area that we see is going to be a high payoff area. We've been at it now for three hectic years. We've had several cliffhangers, but we're still surviving. We've accomplished a lot, and we're still enthusiastic, and we've really had tenacity. It's been a huge learning experience. The aeroplane bit was easy. It's all the things that you put inside, sensors, uh, autopilots and what have you that have given us issues, uh, but we're clear of that now. We need to complete the development of what we have. Uh, there's lots of interest being shown out there. We need to go out on demonstrations, which we're doing. We need to recoup our investment because uh, we've gone through a lot of money. It's an exciting prospect. The real chance here that there could be a new UAV industry established in Canada. And I think that what we have here is on the leading edge of that. 
and we're very pleased. And we have a team and we'll be looking at aeroplanes, new aeroplanes, different aeroplanes in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'd like to call upon Jay Goodsall from Solar Ships to please come and make his presentation. Here, I'm just going to reattach myself. And I guess I put once there. Um, I'm an infectious disease expert, not because I'm a doctor or a scientist, but because I've launched ventures that um, send me into some remote areas and I catch a lot of infectious diseases. I was in uh, a remote clinic one time with fleshy disease on my neck. And I overheard the doctor talking to the nurse saying we thinks we, we have to amputate. And that, uh, that got me a little scared and I started thinking how do I get the hell out of here? And the transport options weren't very good. And so I often joke about that's how I got involved in this. Um, as an infectious disease expert, I can tell you that I think the most destructive pathogen uh, and infectious agent that I know of is doubt. And uh, once you catch doubt, uh, all, if any of these innovators catch doubt, they will fail. And doubt is something that uh, certain places suffer from a lot more than others. And um, in Ontario, um, we don't suffer from doubt around hockey. If anything were to happen in Ontario hockey, there would be rapid improvement. There would be collective intelligence. There would be a lot of collaboration. There would be a lot of investment. Um, Ontario is much bigger at remote area, remote area aviation than it is at hockey. Um, you go around the world, they're called beavers and buffaloes and, and otters for a reason. Um, and uh, so we're really good at that. Um, we're also very good at solar and, and, and the provincial government should be complimented for that because uh, there's a very large solar community here. So if you wanted to do something solar, you will have access to a lot of expertise and, and also electric vehicles. Over 90% of Ontario is really not very well populated. It does not have service year round, not by road. So this is a big problem and it's really a reason why we're so good at remote area aviation. We have a huge industrial base in the south and a very uh, big remote area that's unserviced. So it's a bush plane world out of domestic necessity. It's a, it's a tradition in Ontario to go invent something really cool at home and then export it to the world and typically that's about 10%, 5% at home and then 90% export. Problem, and this, is, this comes from an, uh, an Ontario government publication uh, about what our Ontario's advantages is. We're not very good. We don't really have great self-esteem. We don't really invest in our own. We do innovate quite well, but in terms of just ranking us in North America, we're 18 out of 20 communities that have risk capital in terms of investing in our own. Anybody that believes that 18 out of 20 in anything is competitive is probably just standing in the way of progress. So remote areas um, are very large. They're the fastest growing areas in the world economically. So they crush China in terms of raw economic growth in the next little while. 100 times larger than Ontario in terms of physical space. These are places that do not have infrastructure, need infrastructure. We are the world leaders in that. We should be the world leaders in that. There's only one thing holding us back from that. Um, in terms of um, a market size today, pretty big, 10 times bigger than Canada, but growing at 5.5% right through the recession. Everybody else is shivering in a corner, they were growing. So um, it's a very exciting space to get into. Typically you would see these types of places where the lights are off, but there are often populations and activities. Um, you don't have infrastructure. Um, and so they have uh, high growth and low infrastructure. In these places around transport, you have large demand, little supply. Um, you have the, uh, the typical, uh, the, the usual suspects for, for how you would move things and people. Um, in Africa, Africa is kind of the, the best place to look at because it's got the most amount of potential and the least amount of infrastructure. So the average truck goes 26 kilometers an hour in Africa. Um, from an aviation point of view, that shouldn't be too uh, difficult to take on, especially with a strong headwind. Um, and uh, of course in our north, ice roads are melting. Um, Thunder Bay, for anybody that's grown up in Thunder Bay or, or knows Thunder Bay in the winter, very cold place. Uh, the first ice road went north of Thunder Bay on February 11th this year. That's not a sustainable thing. And if you look at the greatest growth in Ontario and what will carry our healthcare and education system, it'll be northwestern Ontario and yet they don't have infrastructure. Helicopter is a phenomenal machine, especially at $10 a barrel. Um, maintenance, repair, and overhaul, uh, a little difficult with helicopters. Planes, obviously great machines, need fuel and runways. Um, this gap in what transport can do was quite well demonstrated in Haiti. Our head of state was from Jacques Mal, Haiti. Uh, 220,000 people died. Many of them didn't need to die. Eight and a half days, no transport. Uh, 931 kilometers between Jacques Mal and Miami. Um, and so planes couldn't do it, helicopters couldn't do it. Um, that was quite an embarrassing thing for transport at the time. Soccer fields, 
soccer fields are great. They were just fine. And you can go anywhere in the world. You will find a cell phone. You'll also find a soccer field, usually a Coca-Cola bottle, too. So our goal would be to create a vehicle that doesn't need infrastructure. Bring your own. And so uh, uh, without fuel, without runways and roads. The way, if anybody's heard about, there's a lot of talk about airships to the north and cargo airships and things like that. There's a, there's a, there's a law that gets bandied about called the cube square law. Essentially, for if you have dynamic lift, uh, your dynamic lift expands, the lifting surface expands by a factor of square, and your volume of lift, the volume of helium a static lift goes up by a factor of cube, and that's where you get this great economics. People talk about the great economics of lift around this hybrid aircraft. Um, so for us, the, the benefit also is with a flat surface, we are also, the, the square law would apply to the amount of solar surface you have to, available to you. We've built three ships and we are flying them nicely today. Um, I'll go through a little bit of that. Often with these types of things you have false hope. So on November 8th, uh, 2009, we had an RC uh, uh, flight that was beautiful. Everything was working perfectly. It translated really nicely from the computer model and the wind tunnel model and look at that. Um, then we got into piloting and that was really difficult for us. Um, uh, uh, Transport Canada has been very helpful in coaching us on how to do this um, properly and safely. Um, we've had a lot of, we've got a lot of, um, uh, I would say support and advice from uh, the aviation community here, but it took us until about September 2012 to fly it under control. And then when we went down to the United States of America to talk to the four largest airship manufacturers in the world, they said we're the first ones in the world. So when we're at home, we are surrounded by a low self-esteem environment. We would say, well, a lot of people say, well, you can't be doing that because the Americans, you know, how come the Americans, how come the Russians, how come the, you know, the UK, you can't, like, no, you're not doing that. Well, you go down to see the Americans, and they say you're the first in the world to do it. So it's not to be cranky, but it, you, you know, if, if it's going to be cold here, you should wear a parka. You should protect yourself against that kind of doubt. Um, application number one for us is medical. It's critical supplies. It's very, very small. And there are a lot of the highest death rates in the world are in the remote areas. Y you can build a much smaller, much cheaper, much more entrepreneurial startup aircraft and get into remote areas with um, a very uh, small load that is critical. You can also measure the death rates. Who has the highest death rates in Ontario? Northern Ontario, by far. Who has the highest death rates in Canada? Northern Canada. Who has the highest death rates in the world? The remote areas. So you get in there with, uh, with, with critical cargo, you can measure your impact in uh, death rate. Um, and that has, th that's pretty irrefutable. Northern Ontario wants the 20-foot container. Aviation doesn't do intermodal. It doesn't really, aviation's not designed to move shipping containers. So really what Northern Ontario has asked for us is move the shipping container. Um, uh, air cargo is 3% of the global freight business, so it's not really a big thing. Um, ships and trains and trucks, trucks are the dominant force in uh, moving freight around, and uh, trucks need roads. So in the remote areas, they don't have this, and so if we can introduce uh, the shipping container to intermodal, then really it's a great launching point. But to keep it entrepreneurial, because if you don't get large um, amounts of venture capital, you have to find something very small that you can do that is inexpensive and has high impact and has irrefutable impact. Solar, a lot of people doubt that solar is powerful enough. It's true that solar is a wimp, but solar car racing has put testosterone into the engineering community and let's have a race, have a race, have a race. That means that there's a lot of available technology out there and you can go to that community to get a lot of powerful stuff. A, 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 a large catamaran went around the world last year and it was extremely powerful. Um, in the early 90s, there was a very good engineer who launched a solar plane, not a very good marketer. A very good marketer has come along in Solar Impulse, Bertrand Picard from Switzerland, and he flies right through the night with his plane. So you can fly solar, and um, it's amazing how many people say you can't. Um, bush plane community, Zen Air, very, very strong um, uh, practical bush plane uh, operation out of Midland, Ontario. They invested in us, and when they invested in us, all of a sudden there's a bit of a swing. Now there's people who've built 5,000 aircraft. They're very, they've got a big installed base of maintenance, repair, and overhaul in 50 remote area markets around the world. When they believe in you, people start to believe in you. We have submitted 13 proposals, not to sound cranky to the Canadians uh, and Ontarians out there, but 13 proposals is a lot of chopped trees, a lot of paper, and just it, people not sitting beside you looking out at the opportunity saying, how can we do this? It's sort of a protective thing. 
and talking about how we can't do this. We had, for those in the crowd who have an entrepreneurial idea, you have to find a human being in the system, just one, and because they'll be in the room when you're not in the room. And if they can convince people to open their minds about what you can do, that's the start. If you don't have that human being, it's really difficult to do. I would, we would, we've had a really tough time. Fortunately, we're funded, um, and we have this demonstration to put on, so we go to Thunder Bay, we go north, we drop off some critical cargo, and we invite remote area operators from around the world to come to Thunder Bay. And that's really the simple next step for us. Um, our goal is to fly without fuel, take off and land without any infrastructure, and continue a great Ontario tradition of leading the world in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'd like now to call on Marnie McVicker at Arion to make her presentation. Hi, thanks. <coughs> I'm going to use notes. Sorry, guys. Uh, so Arion Labs was established in 2007. We debuted at OC Discovery in 2008. A little scary for us, and our products changed a bit. That's the Arion Scout. If you saw it here, it had, it had bumper guards around it and it was held together loosely with spit and gum. But now we have the Arion Scout. It's out there. It's doing cool things. So we're going to talk about some of the cool things. Our product is kind of interesting, but what our customers do with it is way more interesting. Last week, we announced Sky Ranger. It's bigger and badder than the Scout. It flies a little bit longer. OK, twice as long. It it has improved environmental conditions. It can handle better winds, which is a big issue when you weigh five pounds. It has a touchscreen interface the same as the Scout. So what that affords our operators to do is focus on the, getting the data while we do the flying for them. Very important. Uh, the other thing that this offers is an EOIR uh, data stream. So with our Scout, you have to put, fly with an EO, then go back up with your IR. With this system, it's one payload, and it streams both to the ground simultaneously. OK, some of the cool things that we do. I'll let, the, let it speak for itself. Basically, what we've tried to do is come up with a nice, simple, easy to use, fast, reliable, cost-effective method for getting aerial information. Most people think of air, unmanned aerial vehicles as a military solution. Yeah, and it is, and it's been around for a lot of years. But it's the commercial side that we think is a lot more interesting. So some of the industries we're addressing now, or really our partners are, um, are listed here. We'll go through some of the pictures, and you can see some of the cool things our customers are doing with it. So I put this one first because Richard's a big agriculture guy, and uh, he likes to see this stuff. So it's here for him. So this is with multiple payloads. So what you can do with our vehicle is go up, fly the same route over and over and over again with three simple steps. You tell it to take off. You tell it to go to its first position, and it flies itself and comes home and lands. And it takes the images you see here. They can be then used to, to fuse together for additional information. Here's three different flights over the same area with three different cameras. GIS is another big industry uh, that we're supporting. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, a couple of years ago, Nome, Alaska was running out of fuel. They didn't get their last delivery because the trucks couldn't make it on the road. So what they did is they brought a ship into the harbor, and there was big concern. You know, we're bringing a big ship in. It's full of oil, and it's coming into an ice-filled harbor. H how do we get it in safely? So uh, University of Alaska and BP have some of our systems. They went up, flew, it, flew what we call our auto grid, came back, and stitched the image together to give them 3D information of the existing ice flow so that they could maneuver the ship in safely without any problems. Construction's another cool area. This is, this is fairly new for us is it allows our, our users to go in and take pictures so that people can see the progress. It also helps with security, and that they can go up and see what's changed from the last time they flew. Again, it flies exactly the same route each time. Infrastructure inspection. Because it's a vertical takeoff and landing uh, system, you need about three meters of takeoff and landing, and it comes back and lands exactly where it took off. So what you can do is go out to the areas, fly up, and without having to put people in harm's way, go up, get the images that you see here. In the bottom corner, you can see uh, a smokestack. You can see the flames coming out. In the past, that would take an, a week for them to get up there and get the information. They have to turn off the ovens, wait for it to cool down, send somebody up, take the pictures, and then it takes them another two days to get the plant back up and running. They did this in half an hour without having to shut anything off. 
shoreline assessment, again brought to our, friend, uh, our friends at BP. They've been doing some really cool things since the oil spill. Um, so again, because you can fly the same route over and over, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, and using some change, uh, change detection technology, you can do shoreline assessment. One of the other things that we did is uh, University of Alaska flew off of a boat with our system, which is something no other UAV can do, is, and counted sea lions, which they've never been able to do in the past because helicopters scare them, they don't like people, and they seem to sense when the boats are coming. These guys went up in the middle of the winter and flew in the Bering Straits to count sea lions. So you can see a larger area. It's pretty cool, some of the stuff they do. One of the other companies we deal with in the States um, does some pretty cool site analysis. So they go up, take pictures, and then use it uh, with their software and some 3D modeling so that they can analyze the sites. We think what they do is pretty cool. They're one of our first customers. They also do volumetric analysis. What they used to do is they would take them a day to sit and survey, um, this is actually a coal pit, uh, to look at the coal to see where it had moved and, and how much was there by volume. With our system, it takes them 20 minutes to fly and about a half an hour to process the data and they get much better accuracy using our system than they ever did on the ground. One of the other cool things that you can do is as you go up and you take the pictures, you can then render it back into 3D models. So areas where the satellite imagery has changed um, or it's old or you just want to do some uh, gather what's there, this allows people to do it without having the cost of paying one of those satellite guys for lots of money. Public safety is another key uh, industry for us. Oh, I've got to speed up. I'm running out of time. Um, so you can see all the things that it's doing now. As they say, a picture is worth 10,000 words. This picture was taken in an undisclosed location, um, and it gave law enforcement all the information they needed before they raided the compound. It's available for, it, it's used a lot for uh, security, so it can fly overhead. It's hard to see. It's safe. Um, Tactical operations, again, go in, allows police officer or first responders to see what's there before they send people in into hazardous locations. Again, this is an aerial imagery stitched together so they can see 3D images. Uh, explosives, again, it goes in. You can have a look, see what's there. Uh, the one on the top's not a real accident, <laughs> but the one on the bottom is. It was an accident. We went up, took the images, and stitched them together. The other thing it can be outfitted with are uh, air sensors so that you could send it in to make sure that it's a safe environment prior to sending people into harm's way. It's been used for fire detection. In fact, one of our partners was doing a demonstration and there was a fire um, on the next hill over. They put on the thermal camera, flew over, gave the imagery to the fire people so they knew exactly where the fire was going and what it was doing. And then a little more traditional search and rescue. So from Arion's point of view, we believe that more companies developing more payloads and more data analysis tools will help our product and our industry grow and provide Ontario with more jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie. I'd like now to ask Murray Gable from Carleton University to come up, please. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning. I'm here to speak to you today about some innovations in training and simulation uh, and our role that, that plays in the, uh, in the aerospace sector. First of all, why do we use simulation? Well, there's a number of reasons. Uh, time and time again, studies have showed the cost savings that can be realized by using simulation to support uh, flight crew training. So we're saving money. Training can also be used uh, to allow flight crews to do things that they just can't do, or at least they can't do safely uh, in aircraft in the real world. So there's factors of safety to consider there uh, as well. There's a wide range of tasks that can be accomplished using training and simulation uh, that covers a broad variety of air platforms. We talked about the traditional flight simulator with a pilot, as well as now with the uh, emergence of UAVs, uh, ground control station and crew training associated with it. We've also discovered that while we traditionally think about large flight simulators as big boxes on stilts moving around, that there's a great degree of training that can be achieved with low to medium fidelity simulation devices uh, that assists in the overall cost effectiveness of, of simulation. There are environmental considerations as well. When we're using simulation for training, we are, we're not burning gas. We're not polluting the environment with noise. And lastly, uh, while I'm talking specifically about simulation for flight crew training, 
uh, simulation plays a critical role uh, as it relates to research, analysis, uh, and development uh, in the engineering sector and has for, uh, for many years. I work for the Center for Visualization and Simulation, or VSIM, at Carl University in Ottawa. VSIM is a multidisciplinary facility tying together disciplines with an interest in visualization and simulation, namely cognitive science, aerospace mechanical engineering, and uh, immersive media and architecture interests. We occupy a 60,000 foot square feet facility, uh, which we were allowed to establish through funding from both the provincial and federal governments, and with excellent support from industry partners, including prominent organizations such as CAE, Engrain, Presagis, and many, many others. Lastly, I need to say that the concept of operations that we embraced in creating vSIM and what we do there uh, is underpinned by a proven and excellent support enabled through the collaboration of industry, academia, and our government partners. We couldn't do what we do without that three-tiered collaboration. What we do and, and why we do it, well, the group that I work with, the Advanced Cognitive Engineering Laboratory, are interested in the field of human perception, primarily, and human perception, how it affects fidelity of simulation. As you can appreciate, a, a simulation environment or a flight simulator is, in essence, uh, an approach at fooling the participant into believing that they are somewhere they are not or doing something they aren't actually doing. So I'm sure you can then extend and appreciate that by better understanding how we perceive the world around us, we can understand what is important for a simulation and conversely what is not important and place our emphasis and our focus and our investment on those areas that we've proven objectively to be important in the simulation environment. We like to call this approach focused fidelity. That is, across the breadth of a simulation environment, the fidelity of the simulation is focused on the areas that we know to be most important and most relevant to a particular training context. This all ties into factors that affect development in Northern Ontario and agricultural development insofar as, as you've already heard this morning, uh, the traditional approach to expanding road infrastructure or rail infrastructure uh, is just not economically sustainable. We need different ways of accomplishing the same business. We've heard from experts and you'll see various examples around the show floor of innovations in airships and in uninhabited aerial vehicles as being key enablers to providing alternative solutions uh, for our infrastructure uh, requirements. Where there is an expansion in volume or scope of the airborne platforms, there's an increased need for training for pilots, for ground control operators, and the like. Where there is an increased need for training, there's an increased need for simulation to enable cost-effective and efficient training solutions. As a case study, uh, I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes about the use of night vision goggles in the civilian sector. Now, when most people hear about night vision goggles, they think about the military, they think about special forces and the like. However, the case is that over the last couple of years, there's been an increased usage of night vision goggles or NVGs by both the law enforcement as well as by the EMS or air ambulance services sector. You can appreciate that for operators of an air ambulance attending to a scene of perhaps an accident in a rural community far removed from, uh, from urban centers, there are no prepared airfields, there's no helipads, there's often very little lighting. And this air crew nest has to fly in under inhospitable conditions at night with threats such as electrical wires uh, and other safety risks um, that put the lives of the crew and obviously their ability to service uh, the community uh, in peril. Night vision goggles have the opportunity of expanding the operating environment in the horizon, uh, allowing those air crews to operate safely. An example we can see here that affects the uh, agriculture industry uh, is a use case involving the distribution of pesticides and herbicides uh, in Lee County, Florida. The use of NVGs allowed the uh, crew distributing the pesticides to operate at night in an environment with decreased surface winds to provide for better dissemination of the herbicide and pesticides, to, uh, as well as to decrease the risk to, of exposure uh, of the surrounding community to those pesticides. A simple but, uh, but effective example. The numbers on this chart give you an idea. From 2011 to 2013, the use of NVGs in police helicopters and the EMS service has more than doubled. This trend is expected to continue to triple uh, the use of NVGs over the next couple of years. As a result, Transport Canada and the FAA in the US are developing um, 
regulation frameworks uh, in order to allow them to capture how s standard civil citizens flying their Cessnas may also be able to make use of, of NVGs. Right now, the use by police and EMS are treated as special cases, and special regulatory frameworks are in place to, uh, to support that. So people will be using these NVGs, uh, and the use of simulation, uh, of course, is a key enabler to enabling effective training, uh, as uh, traditionally, uh, the training and simulation environment, the flight simulator industry, isn't currently capable of addressing the needs for training the use of night vision goggles. Simulation can play a critical role there. So in summary, I'd like to say that the uh, growth of the aviation industry in terms of volume of platforms and the scope and type of platforms is going to require increased ability to train and train effectively and in a cost-effective manner. That need can be addressed through the increased use of uh, modeling and simulation for training. As it relates to NVGs, uh, we've seen the traditional flight simulation or flight training industry is not equipped right now to uh, provide training, effective training on NVGs. So anyone who wants to fly an NVGs can only do so by burning gas and flying it in the real world with inherent risks and other factors that I've already discussed associated with that. NVG familiarization and training can be met effectively by medium to low fidelity simulations. That's a significant cost savings and increase in safety. And lastly, as it relates to both, uh, with the ongoing funding from organizations such as OCE, uh, Ontario, industry, and academia are in a prime position to step up and address these needs through simulation and training. Thank you. Thank you, Ver Thank you very much. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes? So I think we'll proceed to a question and or comment period. So if anyone has a question and or comment, I'd like you to go up to the microphones in the aisles or lift up your hand and we'll be happy to bring a microphone to you. Uh, so I'm interested, Rod, when you had your presentation, you had some technologies there, and you said you would have added some based on what uh, Mr. Diamante said yesterday. So what would those technologies be? I think the, uh, I think the uh, uh, computational power that exists uh, has got to be a huge factor for us. If you think about, I sort of alluded to it, and I have sensors and data fusion. So that idea of, of bringing together all of the information that's necessary. I mean, sit, uh, for, for pilots, situational awareness is still the biggest challenge they have, okay? And uh, that is something that could be much enhanced through that uh, sensors data fusion. But what, un what underpins it, of course, is that computing power that he alluded to. The other, uh, the, the other example that uh, not many of us are comfortable with this notion, but there are serious people examining uh, the prospects of pilotless aircraft. We saw the Google car uh, yesterday in uh, Peter uh, Diamandidis' uh, uh, presentation, and uh, it's not unthinkable that you could have somewhere in the foreseeable future, future uh, pilotless aircraft. So uh, I think it's those, um, um, uh, I mean, he mentioned 3D <coughs> printing and so on, but it's, I think more than anything, it's that computational kind of capability that, uh, and the exponential change in that. Say again? Yes, but not on commercial flights yet, thank you very much. That may be a while. Thanks, Estelle. Have you visited our high performance computing area? Uh, OC is in a collaboration uh, with IBM to precisely address these types of issues. So if you, uh, you may wish to uh, check that out. Yeah, it's down the end there someplace. I haven't seen the whole place yet. I've only been here a day and a half. Uh, my name is Estelle Hava. I'm from uh, National Research Council Industrial Research Assistance Program. I'm part of the uh, NRC IRAP Aerospace Sector Team. Uh, NRC is uh, working on approval of a, an NRC aerospace program called a Civilian UAS. Uh, we're reaching out to the uh, uh, community of people who have, uh, it, it's basically focusing on small UASs between 25 to uh, 50 kilograms. 
and uh, we're looking for uh, various uh, SMEs, industry partners to work with us on uh, in this area. So it's not necessarily in the aircraft side, but also huge, you know, software side. One of the big challenges is this whole sense and avoid and materials. So please, uh, please come see me. It's uh, this is going to be a very exciting program, and more and more we're going to need the SME players to help us out on this. Uh, have you made your press release yet? Because I've been talking to George LeBlanc, and we're waiting for the government to actually announce the program. I think from my presentation, you saw that we were already active in many of the areas that are probably of interest to you, and if there's any opportunity of teaming, we'd certainly like to be part of it. Sorry? No, 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 we're, we're 55, 55 kilogram. We're, sorry, 55 pounds, 25 kilogram. Oh, we're a small aeroplane. They're only 15 feet span, so we, but we can do things that are normally associated with much bigger aeroplanes. That's our forte. I, think I, I do have a, I have a question uh, that I'd like to ask any of the panelists, because you're the guys that are dealing with the government agencies. Uh, I constantly hear that Transport Canada is working with you. However, we're way behind the U.S., which surprises me because the U.S. has been the country most threatened in the world versus Canada. And where do you see the future? Are things happening? And uh, when do you have some timeline? Well, Transport Canada has been working uh, with an industry group through UVS Canada. And uh, they've put together some preliminary recommendations as to what the future should be in terms of regulation uh, for aeroplanes and for manufacturers becoming qualified uh, to release their products. I think we're not very far behind the US and in some areas I've heard it argued that we are in front. So I don't think we're deficient. We're, we're certainly doing quite well in the area. A couple of years away I think we may see the regulations in place. Uh, we planned ahead against that. We, we, we did design our airplane to be part 23, which is the civil regulations. We could see this was coming, so we're ready for it. Yeah, in terms of the, in terms of the micro unmanned aerial vehicles, Transport Canada's leaps and bounds ahead of the FAA, I'm sorry. Um, it's been to our advantage. It shut down development of small products like ours in the U.S. because they can't get authorization to fly, whereas we've been flying since 2007 with a lot of support from Transport Canada. I, I can add some anecdotal information to that. I, in February, I was sitting at a dinner table with a fellow from the FAA. They have eight regions, one headquarters, and they have ten different opinions as to what has to be happening. <laughs> well, so, so in the airship space, uh, the FAA uh, does not have um, people, they don't have government employees who are in charge of um, advising on regulation. They have industry. So if you're one of the big manufacturers of airships, then, uh, then usually you, uh, you help, uh, you're the FAA person for your region. Um, and so that would be, uh, at best, collaborative, and some would say that's a little too tight uh, between industry and government. We found Transport Canada to be very helpful, and they also, I think they feel that, that the hybrid airship is coming and our north is in need of it. So um, I don't know how far advanced they are vis-a-vis -vis the FAA uh, in terms of just regulation, but I know they're getting ready and they don't want to be falling behind. Well, I'd like to pass, I'd like to pass the floor on to uh, Richard now. Well, first off, I'd like to thank panel members. I've known many of them for a long time. I've just met Jay today. Um, I, I, I hope we achieved what we, we tried to achieve, which was to stimulate your thought process to show you that uh, innovation is really taking place in aerospace and to also show you that the collaborations are developing. I'd also uh, you know, just like to thank you all for being here. It's, um, you know, we do these things at OCE because we're trying to stimulate these partnerships and we're trying to get more people involved in the process because more people mean more questions uh, and more problems and that's things for us to solve. Um, keep, stay tuned. Uh, the Premier made an announcement yesterday about a voucher program. Uh, in another little while, there will the details will follow, and uh, I don't want to shoot you all, but there, there, there could be a good surprise in the aerospace business. 
So, for that, thank you. It's time to go to lunch, and I have a small token for these gentlemen.